I guess. Uh, Okay, so we will start then. I can see the participants, but okay. Um, so welcome everyone to this uh, seminar organized by Presage. Uh, my name is Marta Dominguez and I will be moderating the discussion together with Rebecca de uh, And today we are very happy to welcome Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan. We are, who are here to present um, a book they have co-authored. The book is entitled Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus, and it's published by uh, W.W. Norton. Um, so let me briefly just introduce them. Jennifer Hirsch is a professor of uh, social medical sciences at Columbia, Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health, and Seamus Ken is a professor of sociology and American studies at Princeton. Uh, university and he's visiting the uh, Centre d'Etudes Européennes remotely uh, this semester. Um, so the book they are going to um, to present or the book they are going to talk about is part of Colombia's sexual health initiative to foster transformation uh, or shift, which was a project co-directed by Jennifer and by uh, Claude and uh, Melins, a clinical psychologist. And the way we are going to organize this is that we are going to have a conversation. I will leave the floor to Rebecca uh, for the questions uh, that she's going to ask the authors. And then we will have some time for, for a Q&A uh, with you if you have uh, questions. I am sure you will have lots of questions about this. So um, we will open the floor for, question, for questions later on. So before I, we start, I just wanted to uh, give you a little trigger warning. Of course, you know, this is going to be a conversation about sexual uh, assault and sexual violence. So there might be things that uh, might be difficult to hear. Um, and I will share some resources that might be useful if any of you needs to uh, get more information about this or needs to talk to someone about these issues. Okay, so thank you very much, Seamus and Jennifer, for being here. And uh, Rebecca, the floor is yours uh, for the questions. Yes, so thank you again for being here uh, there today and for sharing with us your insights about sexual violence. Uh, so there are a lot of questions we would like to ask you, but uh, given the time we have, uh, we had to make some choices. So do not hesitate uh, to add elements you think are relevant if our questions uh, do not allow you to address the main points of your study. So let's first talk about the origin of your study and the results you get. First and foremost, can you tell us about the SHIFT study and why you decided to write Sexual Citizens? I'm muted. Obviously, I've never done this before. Um, so Seamus and I are delighted to be with all of you, and obviously, we wish we could be there in person. Um, so I'm actually going to open with a story from the book. Um, Austin was one of the very engaging research subjects that we spoke with. When we spoke with him, he was towards the end of his time as an undergraduate. Um, the scene with Austin and his girlfriend in the book is the only really sexy sex scene. Um, it, was, uh, it was a holiday weekend. Um, they'd been planning to watch the fireworks. Instead, they made their own fireworks. Not gonna describe that here. Um, but he uh, was not just a good boyfriend, but also uh, committed to being a good lover. He and his girlfriend had actually developed nicknames for the kinds of orgasms that she had. Um, so he was doing his part to narrow um, what's been documented in the United States as the orgasm gap, which is um, men enjoying uh, sex much more than women uh, at that age on college campuses. Um, so he seems sweet. And it was surprising both to us and to him to hear him talk about assaulting someone. We asked everyone we interviewed about their best and worst sexual experience. And he didn't start out by describing an assault. He started out by talking about what he, he said was a weird experience. And he recounted very early in his time at college, um, Columbia is a residential campus, so almost all of the first year students live on campus. Um, he described being shuffled off into someone else's bedroom so that his roommate could be alone with his roommate's girlfriend. And um, when he walked into that bedroom, there was a young woman in bed. Um, 
and she mumbled to him that she was drunk and that she didn't want to do anything. And like, that's weird that when a stranger comes into your bedroom, you have to establish a sexual boundary. Um, but he didn't respect it. Instead, he got in bed with her rather than in the other bed that was empty um, and began to touch her body. And then he stopped himself. And, um, but he, he, when he first described that, he didn't label it an assault. It was only later in the interview when we asked him, what is a sexual assault? And he had the information, he said, a sexual assault is anything sexual that happens without the person's consent. Um, and then he stopped and he became very distraught. And he said, um, if you'll excuse me, fuck me. Like he was wrecked to, to acknowledge that, that that was something that he had done given the person that he had grown into, into being. Um, and so we started uh, the Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation and Seamus and I wrote Sexual Citizens to change the conversation about incidents, in, incidences like that away from adjudication um, and towards the question of prevention. In 2014, when we began the SHIFT project, there was a very intense popular discussion about campus sexual assault, but it was really focused on how to hold people, individuals accountable and how institutions could be held accountable which are very important questions, but Seamus and I are social scientists, not lawyers. And um, what was missing from that conversation was an understanding of how sexual assault is socially produced. And so rather than looking at people as bad people or broken people, looking at um, the social organization of sexual behavior and sexual assault on campus to see how it is engineered into institutions, which sounds kind of grim, except that once you see how it's engineered in, you can think about what would be required at the institutional and social level to engineer it out. So SHIFT was a very big research project. I'm not gonna go very much into the weeds. There was a survey component. Seamus and I co-led the ethnography. We also worked with the administration um, to be in conversation about what policy changes might result from that. But the overall takeaway from sexual citizens is that our goal is to help people think um, about how to prevent sexual assault in a new way. And that, that involves focusing on sexual assault as something that is a predictable element of social organization rather than only something that bad people do. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very clear answer. So um, to go a little bit further, uh, the book is centered around three big ideas, sexual citizenship, sexual projects, and sexual geographies. These are the lens through which you make sense of sexual assault. Can you share with us how these ideas interact with each other? Yes, absolutely. And um, uh, also extending my thanks uh, um, to everyone for, for bringing us here for this conversation. Um, like Jennifer, I'm going to open with a story, and the, the purpose of that is to bring you all into um, what this study is, which is the ethnographic portion of SHIFT. Um, so Charisma described Columbia and Barnard, where we did our research, as a white institution or a white space. And, you know, her, her sort of elaboration of that idea was that it was filled with guys who drank too much, couldn't dance, listened to shitty music, and didn't find her attractive. And Charisma was a woman of color who felt like the organization of campus life really sort of wasn't for her. And so she um, ended up meeting a guy um, who she was going to find more attractive than these white guys who drank too much and listened to bad music and couldn't dance very well. Um, she met someone through her roommate and they texted back and forth for a couple of weeks. And then she finally went out to Brooklyn to see him. And uh, the trip from Columbia to Brooklyn it can take a long time, particularly if the subways aren't running well and everything. And it took her, you know, about an hour and a half to get there. She was soaking wet. Um, uh, she ended up in his apartment, you know, peeled off some of her wet clothes, uh, had a drink, smoked a joint with him. They started to make out and everything was fine. And then he put his hands somewhere she didn't want them. And she moved them away and he put them right back. And 
Then she described having sex with him, even though in her words, uh, she described it as having sex. She also told us about saying no. Um, and she reasoned that he must have thought she was uncomfortable because he repositioned her. Now, you can read that story and think, what a terrible guy that guy is. And that's not a bad take. It's not a bad read of the story. Um, but Jennifer and I want to think about that story um, a little bit differently or to add a different layer into understanding it. And the three concepts, sexual projects, sexual citizenship, and sexual geographies allow us to do that. So sexual projects um, are the answer to the question, what is sex for? And you may think like only two academics could ask a question like, what is sex for? Uh, but as it turns out, it's not an easy question for most people to answer. Part of the reason for that is that sex is for lots of different things. It's for status, it's for flat pleasure, it's for connection with people, it's a way to cultivate an identity, it's for a lot of different things. And one of the things that we do in this project is place sexual assault in conversation with sexual experiences. So to say that you can't understand why assaults happen if you, can't, if you don't look at the multiple things people are trying to do with their sexual and intimate lives. In that story, um, and in a series of stories that we tell through uh, Charisma's experiences, we note how Charisma didn't really have a clear sense of what sex was for for her. She figured it out through a lot of trial and error. Um, but we saw a kind of community level failure um, for communities to talk with people about what sex is for. Um, the other failure that we saw was a failure to develop um, not just a sense of clarity about what sex should be for, but how to treat other people in sexual situations. Sexual citizenship then sort of layers on to the idea of sexual projects. And sexual citizenship is the idea that people have the right to say yes to sex and the right to say no to sex. Um, that is that people have the right to sexual self-determination, but that they also have an obligation to recognize that the people they're with have equivalent rights. So in that story with Charisma, the man that she was with had a really clear sense of his right to sexual self-determination, but a totally impoverished sense of Charisma's equivalent rights. And within heterosexual contexts, we found that this was fairly common, that men had a highly cultivated sense of their own right to sexual self-determination, but frequently denied women's equivalent rights. Um, uh, we'll also note that in that story, Charisma's own sense of her right to sexual self-determination was, like many women, pretty underdeveloped, um, not out of a failure of hers, but out of a failure of the communities that sort of uh, raised her, um, that the denial of women's sexual citizenship and women's right to sexual self-determination was something that was socially organized. And so to return to Jennifer's answer, these two concepts show the sort of social organization of sex and sexuality. The third concept, sexual geographies, also points explicitly to social organization. And there are multiple parts of the sexual geographies of the story that I told of Charisma. The first is that Charisma was far away from her uh, dorm room on campus in a space controlled by a man. And um, one of the things that Jennifer and I note is the deep intertwining of space and power and how more powerful people tend to have more access to space, and that within sexual interactions, more powerful people tend to have control over the spaces where those interactions happen. And so a power analysis of space is necessary. But that power analysis requires an intersectional framework. So it wasn't just that Charisma was in his space, it was also that she wasn't like other Columbia and Barnard students, she wasn't wealthy. Um, a woman of color from a working class background, she couldn't just you know, open up an app on her phone and be whisked back home uh, to her own space. It would have cost $60. She didn't have $60. And so that intersectional perspective really matters. But it's not just class that's the intersections. The reason I opened with describing Columbia and Barnard as a white space is because spaces tend to be highly racialized as well. So thinking about space in gendered, classed, and racialized ways helps us see the multiple forms of intersecting power um, that may lead uh, uh, or make sexual assaults more likely, but critically, as Jennifer indicated before, are also modifiable. So that the rules about control over space or the use of space are things that institutions have some power over. And so Jennifer and I want to use these concepts of sexual projects Sexual, sexual citizenship and sexual geographies to begin to uncover some sort of 
you know, untilled territory or underdeveloped territory for interventions that aren't just about talking to people about how they shouldn't assault others, but instead changing aspects of the social environment that could make assault less likely in the first place. So you talk about the role of power in sexual assault, but can you speak to what you were able to reveal about the way that race, but also sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, and other social identities can influence the likelihood of sexual assault and how youth with marginalized identities experience power and sexual citizenship differently? Um, sure. So, I mean, the earliest research on sexual assault um, surfaced the importance of looking at power relations, but mostly the focus was on gendered power inequalities. And as Seamus was saying, we take a much more intersectional approach. So gender is fundamental to understanding um, uh, sexual assaults, but it's also insufficient. Uh, an example would, be, I mean, I think the charisma story gives a very clear example of how race is always part of um, thinking about sexual assault. Uh, every single black woman that we spoke with in the ethnographic research had experienced unwanted, non-consensual sexual touching, every single one. And so that just highlights how fundamental it is to go beyond gender because you can't understand those instances of unwanted touching without centering attention to anti-Black racism. Um, that was also true for men in terms of the way they navigated uh, the terrain of consent. A lot of the men that we spoke with were concerned about false accusation, which we have to say is vanishingly rare. Um, but the Black men that we spoke with had very specific concerns about false accusation that um, are sort of obvious in the context of all of American history, where so much of anti-Black racism has focused on um, physical violence towards Black men, uh, it, grounded in a fiction of the sort of the fears of, of um, protecting white womanhood. So Carl, for example, told us this story, he, he didn't even have drunk sex because to him that felt too dangerous to, to meet up with a girl at a party and have them both be drunk and have sex because he was so afraid of being falsely accused. But he told us this long story about meeting a girl at a party, a white girl, and she was interested in him and it didn't feel safe to him to um, have sex with her when she was so drunk. And so they walked around for hours and hours until she was a little more sober. And then even when they got back to his room, she still seemed too drunk. And so they, he kept talking, he was sort of putting it off. And then finally, when she seemed sober enough, they had sex. And then he recorded her saying that she had had a good time without telling her that he was doing that. And he told us in the interview that he had actually looked up the law in New York State to find that a recording made without the other person's permission could be used as evidence. So like, that's how afraid he was of being falsely accused. So the, the big point here is that you really can't understand the terrain of sexual assault without looking um, at many forms of power inequality. So the story that, that I shared about race, that's specific to race, but it also stands in for economic inequalities or age inequalities, or um, we didn't look at this in our research, but inequalities between students and professors. So many kinds of inequalities could fit into that analysis of um, our argument that you need to go beyond gender. And then another part of our um, analysis of power is that you don't have to be powerful to deploy power in a sexual interaction. Um, and the example that we use of this is Maddie, who was assigned male at birth and was transitioning um, to being a woman. Um, Maddie was in an intimate relationship and cared a lot about her partner and wanted to have sex with her partner, but she didn't wanna have sex using her penis because to Maddie, that felt like an erasure of the woman that she was becoming. And her partner really pushed her 
to have sex using her penis and finally said to her, you must not want to do it because you don't think I'm beautiful. And that like hit home to Maddie because she knew what it felt like to be told by other people that, that you weren't appealing. And so she gave in, but she experienced that as an assault. And so that's an, an illustration of one of the factors that puts uh, sexual and gender minorities at very high risk of experiencing assault because they, they do experience um, the highest documented rates of assault on campus. And that's not, there's not one explanation of why that happens, but part of it um, is to think about Maddie and her partner in the social context. Mar Maddie was so reliant on her partner because she didn't have a lot of other sources of emotional support. And so the power that we see operating there is actually the power of the gender binary to oppress people who are outside of it. So it wasn't the power dynamic, it wasn't only the power dynamic between Maddie and her partner, but rather it was the social context. And what about men? Uh, men's experiences of being sexually assaulted are often ignored. So what does your study tell us about those experiences? So in the um, broader study that we were a part of, and there was a quantitative portion of that study, um, that quantitative portion was uh, led by Claude and Mellons. In that, we found non-trivial rates of uh, experiences of non-consensual sex um, uh, among men. And importantly, and Jennifer just noted that uh, among the LGBTQIA communities, there are some of the highest rates of assault, but we found that two thirds of the assaults that men experienced were committed by women. Um, and you know, it highlights how the sort of a simple lens that looks at toxic masculinity or um, a, a rape culture, uh, it's not that those concepts are wrong, it's that they're insufficient and too simplistic. Um, and the argument that we make in Sexual Citizens is that uh, assault is not one thing. It's actually many different things. And so if we think about this as a variable, um, uh, whether or not someone experiences assault, well, under that variable are actually very, very different kinds of um, subjective and relational experiences. Um, the experience of being assaulted when sober by a partner that you've been in a relationship for some time is a very different experience than the experience of being touched on a dance floor um, in, in an unwanted way. And, um, you know, one young man told us a story about uh, his freshman year being at a fraternity, fraternity party and um, how in succession two women walked up to him and um, touched his penis. And he was an African-American man and he described that experience as like, you know, um, deeply embarrassing for him. He didn't describe it as an assault. Um, and in the book, we talk about it as an experience of, of course, gender-based uh, um, uh, uh, assault, but also racialized um, where there was a sort of a fantasy among the white women on campus of black men's penises that like they felt totally legitimate in walking up to him and touching uh, uh, him. Um, there are also assaults that men experience um, as trans men, um, uh, uh, which we tell in the book, um, but also as gay men, um, and that those experiences are different uh, than the kinds of assaults that heterosexual men um, experience. The lens that we want you to take, so uh, maybe I'll just quickly tell the story of Adam, who um, grew up in a conservative family in the Midwest. He wasn't out uh, to his um, family. He couldn't be out to them, and he was thrilled to get to New York. Um, and so uh, he thought, like, when I get to New York, it's going to be like the promised land for gay men. And um, there sure were a lot of gay men for Adam in New York, but like, he found it kind of disappointing because the guys would sort of say they were interested, hook up with him, and then ghost him. Ghost him meaning they wouldn't text him back ever again. And Adam like really wanted a relationship. And so he um, uh, eventually found a relationship and he, he described his relationship in like really loving terms, um, in terms of sort of affection and value, except he noted that his boyfriend was sometimes really forceful about sex. And he recounted to us an experience where his boyfriend came home really drunk one evening and in Adam's words, he basically raped me. 
Um, Adam refused to describe that as a rape. He refused to talk to his friends about it because he was worried that his friends would end up hating his boyfriend. And he sort of tolerated the experience in part because the relationship was so valuable to him. Now, if we look at that kind of story as a, as a man's experience of assault, what it does is highlight how the sort of classic tropes that we deploy to make sense of assaults don't always help us understand what happened. Adam was sober. He was in a relationship. He was in a committed relationship. Um, you know, and all of those things uh, did not, in fact, protect him from the experience of assault. The way that Jennifer and I think about that is how um, uh, Adam's experience um, of silence and shame around sexuality, which is actually an experience not that not only had a, a, a gay men experience, a wide range of uh, uh, people experience silence and shame around sexuality, didn't really allow him to raise his voice about his right to sexual self-determination. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the other thing we, uh, it's important to know when telling men's experiences of assault, is also to note that like most assaults are committed by men. Um, they are by far the most likely to commit assaults. And it may be a curious way to think about it, but Jennifer and I encourage people to think about men who commit assaults in ways that like challenge just the idea that they're fundamentally broken people. There are some fundamentally broken people who seek to harm. But we argue in the book that that is probably not the majority of assaults and that like we fail men in raising them in ways that make them more likely to assault. That is, we should think about the failures of prevention, not just in terms of victims who experience enormous harms, but also in terms of raising people in ways that make them likely to commit harms. And that that is, made, that is not as great of a, of a problem, but it's also something that we need to highlight as part of the discussion of prevention and the transform, transformation of our social institutions and structures to make assaults less likely. Okay, so thank you very much for this quick overview of your results. And now let's turn to the policies implications of your work. In the book, you discuss sex education as necessary for preventing sexual assaults. Can you talk more about what you learned about the importance of sex education through your study? Uh, sure, and some of this may seem very particular to the American case, um, and maybe some of it is not. Um, the survey that Seamus mentioned found um, in a paper authored by my husband um, that women who had had comprehensive sex education before college were half as likely to be raped. That is a big effect size, right? That is the target effectiveness for the COVID vaccine. So essentially there is already a vaccine for sexual assault. It won't prevent all sexual assaults, but it could prevent a lot of them. Um, and yet the policy landscape uh, in the United States is very um, mixed. It would be the kindest way to describe it. Um, uh, there are actually nine states where if sex education is provided, it must discriminate against gay people. So it must tell young people that homosexuality is not a preferred option. Um, there are still states where young people get the message that sex should only happen within marriage. Um, when we asked the students that we interviewed at Columbia and Barnard about their sex education, frequently um, they would laugh and they would say, oh, you know, my sexual diseases class. Um, and, you know, the message that they had gotten was about all the terrible things that could happen uh, if they had sex, the, you know, diseases and pregnancy. Um, and we connect that in the book to the idea of sexual citizenship and to the sort of very profound American denial of young people's sexual citizenship. And we see sex education, you know, sex positive, pleasure oriented, um, medically accurate, inclusive sex education as not just about conveying information, but also as a sort of a way to advance and 
uphold the idea that young people have a right to sexual self-determination, which is in many places in the United States, a very radical position. Um, so it's, it, it's, we talk a lot about sex education, not because we think it's gonna fix everything, but because to the extent that the state has a role in this, it is, we think the most important thing um, that the state could be doing to, uh, to teach young people how to have sex without hurting other people. I mean, if you think about driving, there's a whole landscape that prepares young people to drive, right? You don't just say to your children, you know, you don't just let them grab the keys and hope that they figure it out when they're drunk. And that is kind of how we manage young people's sex in America is by saying, not under my roof, good luck with that. Don't get hurt, don't hurt anyone else. And so sex education um, as a policy strategy would really move us forward. And in the book, you tell the story of a young man who realizes as he's talking to you that he had committed an assault. So along with the need for sex education, this story and others in the book highlight the need for conversations about restorative and transformative justice. Can you speak more to these ideas and how we as a society should consider shaping sexual citizenship with a new set of values? Yes. Um... You know, in a, in a phrase, we are not going to punish our way out of this. And um, if we think about a range of social problems that we have uh, faced, um, the idea that punishment is the pathway to transformation is naive. Or actually, punishment is a pathway to transformation, but it's usually a pathway to community dissolution, um, not a pathway to positive community change. So, you know, Jennifer and I are deeply informed by um, the past 40-year uh, experience, and really longer, but we would point to the past 40-year experience of mass incarceration in the United States. And the idea that if we could just punish, if we could just punish effectively, if we could just figure out how to hold people accountable, then we would get the change we wanted. And Jennifer and I believe strongly that there should be accountability for assault. So don't, don't get us wrong on this. But we also believe strongly that that accountability does not produce positive community transformation. So it helps us you know, establish boundaries and, and guidelines. It helps recommit ourselves to the norm of equality. Um, and the norm of, of, of uh, addressing harms when they're experienced. But that process is not going to prevent assaults. And so what Jennifer and I want to point to is how in almost always focusing in a deeply reactive way to sort of after an assault happens, there's sort of an uproar ab about it for good reason but that imagination that like, if we punished this one person correctly, we're going to like make future people not do it. Like, just think for a moment about, you know, the last decade of French politics and the number of people who have had a major scandal uh, around non-consensual uh, sexual activity. So I say decade, because I'm going back to say Strauss-Kahn, for example. And like the, the thought that like, oh, if we just gotten that one thing right, all of the, the future scandals would have gone away. And what Jennifer and I are saying is like, no, of, of course they're not gonna go away. We need instead a different kind of approach, something to layer onto um, our response after these things happen but a preventative approach that says, how do we maybe prevent these things from happening in the first place? Because if they don't happen in the first place, there's fewer of them to actually adjudicate. And our argument is that the prevention of sexual violence is grounded in a broad commitment to equity. And gender equality is a fundamental feature of that and perhaps the most important feature, um, particularly if we remember that um, women may not be the most likely to experience assaults, but they experience the vast majority of assaults, and that men commit the vast majority of assaults. And so gender equity cannot be um, uh, ignored as part of this conversation. But equality writ large 
has to be the sort of commitment. So the queer assaults that people experience mostly ex are experienced within the queer community. And Jennifer and I do not take the position that there's something toxic about queerness. Instead, it's that there's something toxic about the inequities that are structured into the experiences of queer people's lives. Um, similarly, we cannot address this without thinking about race. Now, this may seem like we've taken what is a big problem and turned it into an even much bigger problem, right? So we can't just, we don't just address uh, sexual assault, we have to take on inequality in society and its multiple forms, class, race, gender, ability, sexuality, et cetera. Um, but the advantage of this approach is that it builds a kind of broader coalition of stakeholders. So rather than just thinking about, say, you know, the small group of people who take this on, that work that we do towards the realization of racial equality will in fact help reduce experiences of sexual violence. Work that we do towards creating the conditions of economic equality will in fact help reduce some of the experiences of sexual violence. And so that tends to be our framework, which is to say that for as much as we focus on you know, the outrage and often the deeply justifiable outrage of these events when they happen, what we need to remind ourselves is, you know, to repeat the phrase, we can't punish our way out of social problems. And instead, we need to think about what are the positive community transformations that we could do to um, uh, 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 make these things less likely to happen in the first place. And, you know, that approach, while kind of radically different, is one grounded a little bit more in like a vision of empathy and hope, um, which is kind of the, the main sort of, we, ho we, 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 we hope it's the sort of main feel for the book as you move your way through it. So maybe to finish and to wrap up, uh, what strategies do you think campus and community advocates uh, should implement moving forward to tackle uh, campus sexual violence? Um, so our overall framework is a public health approach. Um, and we know from the history of public health that our biggest impact, whether it's on infectious diseases or smoking, um, our biggest impact is not working one person at a time, um, but rather transforming the environment. And so um, both on campus and off campus, our emphasis is on community level transformation um, because we know it's not very effective to tell people to be better people, right? Um, that's, that's not our A game in public health. And so concretely what that looks like um, at the community level is to um, sex ed, as we've already said, but also to encourage families to talk more with their children and to connect the everyday lessons that they convey about not being a terrible person uh, to sex. I mean, as a parent, so many times you say to your child, don't grab, use your words. Um, and that is really a sexual assault prevention message, right? Don't grab someone's body. Um, and so it's just about making those connections, which requires um, parents to acknowledge uh, their children's emerging sexual citizenship. And then at the campus level, some of our recommendations um, about transforming the sexual geographies are very specific to an American residential campus where campuses are sort of total institutions that provide housing and food and healthcare. Um, and so that's perhaps a little bit less applicable in your context, but the idea of thinking about sexual geographies and thinking about who has access to space, both space for um, sex and space for hosting social events, how that maps onto power, and then how um, institutions of higher education could think about transforming those sexual geographies. Our argument is not that um, that, that good spaces for socializing should be taken away from wealthy white men, but rather um, in the American context that campuses 
could do more to make sure that women and queer students and students of color have access to spaces that they control where they can choose the music. Think back to the story that Seamus told about charisma. If there had been more spaces on the Columbia campus where charisma could have hosted her own party, she would not have ended up in Brooklyn. And so um, even though some of the recommendations that we make are very specific to the US context, that way of thinking about what is required to transform the environment um, is applicable anywhere. Okay, thank you very much for this very clear answer. So maybe uh, now we can uh, give the floor to the participants and uh, ask, uh, hear for their questions. So do not hesitate to write uh, your questions on the Q&A. Yes, you can also write your questions in French if you prefer, and we will, if it's easier for you, we will translate if needed. Uh, yes, I think everyone can see the Q&A. While people are, are thinking about their questions, um, mm -hmm. we can say a little bit more about the research design. Um, There's, if yes, be you can. Um, okay. You know, we can always fill time, right? Um, so the overall study that I co-led with Claude included two forms of survey research. So it was a population-based survey um, that with a representative sample of undergraduates from Columbia and Barnard. Barnard is the women's college, which is affiliated with Columbia. Um, there was a daily diary study, which was a quantitative daily diary study where we followed students for 60 days. Um, and then there was an ethnography, um, which involved interviews, participant observation, focus groups, and key informant interviews. And it's very important to, to underline that Seamus and I were not the ones going to student parties because that would have been super creepy. Um, and so we had a team of research assistants who were not students at the university, um, but who were more the age of the students that, um, that they were spending time with and importantly had the capacity to stay up much later than either of us did. Yes, uh, thank you so much <laughs> for explaining that. Uh, there's a question on the, on the chat about um, how some institutions might have responded to the to the um, to sexual to sexual violence. But I think you can read that uh, by yes deciding not to organize events anymore or not to hold events anymore. Um, you think what's the problem with the, that type of solution and what would be uh, the alternatives? Well, I mean, um, some of it is that Jennifer and I have a very kind of evidence-based approach to what it is that we'd like to see happen. And so, um, you know, the, the idea that like not holding sports competitions or not having parties um, would have an effect is, is, is not particularly well established, I would say, within the broader literature. But more importantly, you know, we, we should think about some of the unintended consequences of uh, policies. And so if um, public institutions begin to stop doing things, it's not that people stop doing them. It's that um, the potential po power of private individuals to organize those things becomes even greater. And those individuals with more resources will have greater control over how things happen. And so, you know, um, if say a, an organization like Sciences Po begins to say, we will no longer have any sort of extracurricular events, we will no longer have any kind of celebrations, like will celebrations stop among the entire community of people um, across the range of Sciences Po campuses? The answer is like, absolutely not. They will become privatized and they will become the kinds of things that they maybe happen in a bar uh, uh, near campus instead of in a campus space. And what that does is it empowers people who have power outside of the context of the institution. And so, you know, one of the unintended consequences of such a policy would be that like um, uh, more powerful students, wealthier students, more powerful administrators may have even more power 
um, in that in in those contexts. And so we have to consider what the unintended consequences of policies are. Recognizing, of course, the um, huge like uh, um, sets of inequalities that are already built into um, uh, the society. And so, you know, um, uh, in the United States, uh, in the Greek life system, um, so fraternity and sorority system, there is a rule. And the rule is that um, fraternities can serve alcohol at poor parties and sororities cannot. And this gives men control over the distribution of alcohol in party spaces that are used by students who are younger. Um, and that is a rule that shouldn't necessarily mean that we ban men's organizations, but we should think about the sets of policies we have around organizations that have unintended consequences. Or another just quick example on this, there is a tendency that as people gain seniority, they have access to better space. So this happens uh, at the student body level at Columbia and Barnard in terms of housing. So what happens? Well, if two young people are hanging out and they're going to go back to somebody's room, they go back to the person who's more likely to have a single and who's more likely to have a better space. That in effect funnels younger people into spaces controlled by older people. We can also think about this on a faculty level. Jennifer and I have seen our colleagues cry over the size of their offices because it did not reflect the status position that they, that they held. And that space and control over space and status are deeply intertwined. And what the institution might do is think about how it could, and I hate this word, but I'm going to use it anyway, disrupt that or, or unsettle that association between space and power. And as faculty, it may mean questioning in a, in a fundamental way um, our association between power and space and control, but also recognizing how in intertwining those things, we are building inequities into the fabric of our institutions, and that one of the consequences of that is uh, increased experiences of sexual assault, as well as lots of other kind of negative uh, experiences that people have. Thanks, you know, we have several questions on the chat. So let me maybe take um, uh, Francisca about uh, the notions of, of shame regarding specific uh, sexual activities um, or taboo practices, for instance. Did that have an influence on or did that play out? in the conversations that you had with the with the students yeah i mean the the our our grasp of the idea of sexual citizenship comes in particular from um having heard so many young women say again and again recounting a situation that they were in a room with a man they wanted to leave and they gave him a blow job just to get out of there and so that sort of one-way flow of sexual pleasure, which is very, very normalized on college campuses, has its roots um, in men's socialization to being, in heterosexual men's socialization into being not attentive to women and their sexual pleasure, and in women being socialized into the non-importance of their sexual pleasure. I mean, imagine a meal where one person always cooked and the other person always ate. That would be truly bizarre, right? As part of, as, as sort of a social interaction. And yet that is how there is, there is a lot of sex like that on college campuses. And so that has everything to do with um, a very particular sexual shame because it's not just shame for everyone, but it's shame towards particular kinds of bodies, towards women's bodies, towards queer, people's bodies and sexual desires. Um, and then layered on top of that, um, I think the deep commitment in America towards young people's sexual ignorance, right? We work hard to preserve that sexual ignorance um, is grounded in the idea, um, in the sort of ambivalence that you see in America around sex where there's sort of prurience everywhere and yet um, a, a very deep discomfort with sex as, as a fun activity um, uh, and all sorts of moralizing. I mean, and, and in, in sexual citizens, we are moralistic about sex, but rather than focusing on um, 
you know, kinds of partners or kinds of acts. Um, our moralism is about the fundamental need to recognize that the person that you're having sex with is a person and has the right to sexual self-determination, um, regardless of whether it's a, a passing uh, sexual interaction or um, in the context of an ongoing relationship. Um, so yeah, shame, very important. Thank you. There's Anna Maria also who mentioned something that I think was quite important in, in the book, and it's the role of group pressure and, and the relationship to others. Um, and how that, you know, plays a role in, in whether people identify something as sexual assault or, or how they label um, their experiences. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, so, in actually, I think I can also relate this to um, uh, the next question as well about bystander intervention. Um, you know, the the focus on consent, um, which is incredibly important, uh, frequently thinks about um, uh, or frames sex as an experience between two people, as an almost contractual relationship, right? And um, you know, so the was or was there not consent becomes fundamentally the question. And uh, in the book, we have a chapter called The Power of the Group. And um, it points a little bit to bystander intervention. We actually have a paper on bystander intervention as well that gets into this um, issue much more deeply. But you know what that notes is that social groups set up sexual situations and um, frequently do a lot of work to interpret sexual encounters. So in the book, we tell the story of a woman who, um, uh, you know, described going to this guy's uh, uh, suite where he was with his teammates and kind of partying with him for a little bit, you know, just hanging out. And um, she was with some friends, her friends left. And then she said he pulled some weird alpha male shit, um, by which she meant that he kind of made some sort of signal and all of his friends left and the, suddenly the situation was a sexual situation and um uh they had sex uh, he was not at all interested in her sexual pleasure he just handed her clothes back to her when she was done and kind of dismissed her and as she walked out the door she realized that his friends had been waiting there listening um now part of this is about how groups created sexual situations how um you know, his friends did that. Uh, but the story that she told us continued into the next morning. And she described hanging out with a group of women who were part of like a champagne brunch set, by which she meant like a group of wealthy women who went out and spent exorbitant amounts of money on champagne um, for their Sunday brunches. And she was very excited about the sexual encounter that she'd had that night not because it was pleasurable, not because she felt gross about it. She didn't think about it as it was an assault to her. She consented to it. Um, the fact that his friends were listening in was kind of a violation of her privacy, but maybe didn't raise to the level of, of anything like assault. It was just a shitty thing to do in kind of her language, but she still was super excited. Why? Because this guy was really hot and very like recognized as sort of a desirable person on campus. And so at this brunch, one of the things that they did was talk about who they'd hooked up with in the past week. And she was excited because she like had a great card to play in that conversation, which was this guy. She could pull up his picture on Facebook, show him to the, the, her peers, and she would acquire a lot of status. What that points to is sort of the enormity of group dynamics and intergroup relationships in setting up sexual situations, in setting up sexual interpretations, and in helping define for us our sexual projects. Now, bystander intervention has been shown to be quite effective, or it's one of the few interventions that has been shown to be effective. But in our work on it, one of the things that we note is that bystander interventions work very differently for different kinds of men, that they tend to be things that people enact um, 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 in different ways, depending upon whether or not they know the person they're intervening with, whether or not that person is part of their social group, so to preserve the status of that group, et cetera. What all of this points to is like 
just thinking about sexual assault as a two-person interaction where the question is consent is sort of interpreting sexual assault from the framework of adjudication. And what Jennifer and I are trying to do in this book is to socialize our understandings of assault, which is to think about how institutional structures, group level dynamics, and interpersonal relationships in a combined way constitute situations. And in those sort of constitutions, like each one of those levels, if we do a multi-level or multi-sectoral analysis, have some points of intervention for prevention. So obviously individual level education is part of it, but it's not the only part of it. Thinking about the dynamics of groups within a community and asking how say sociologists like me would, would, would consider interventions within group level dynamics that may provide for things that, that sort of shift the sexual opportunity structure. Um, those sort of are, from my perspective, it, it opens up space for social scientists to have a lot more to say and to sort of claim some of the ground in this discussion um, uh, from sort of the legal uh, dimensions of it or the punishment dimensions of it. And, and that's really what we're trying to do in this book is like to say that one of the reasons why we keep having the same conversation is we keep looking at the problem in the same way. And it's frequently looking at it in a highly desocialized way. Thank you. We have we don't have a lot of time, <laughs> and I'm guessing that you you kind of answered uh, one question that's here about the whether you think that providing more information about how students about their own sexuality and how to find your own sexual uh, pleasure uh, that would play an important role in prevention. And if I understood you right, you would probably say yes. Uh, but probably that should happen before university, <laughs> when we come to university. It's probably a bit um, too late. Uh, okay, and then we have just two questions left. One of them is in French. I don't know if you can uh, read it. So maybe I will just uh, mention both and then let you choose one of them, <laughs> the one you think uh, might be more interesting. So there's one question about where well, Morrison, or you can answer, provide an answer in two minutes. <laughs> that, that would be the, uh, the, the rule, I think. Uh, the recommendations for restorative justice in the case of uh, campuses. And the question in French is about whether you had information about sexual assaults not committed among students, but where you know someone else at the university was involved, for instance, a teacher or some of that. Um, so just to, to take the last one, um, mm -hmm. in the survey, um, which was, I just want to emphasize, it was a representative survey of undergraduates with a very, very high response rate, 67%. Um, um, there were zero reported instances of undergraduates being assaulted by faculty. Um, Seamus and I think that our colleagues in the United States really have gotten the message that that is not okay. Um, not okay to have sex with them and not okay to assault them, period, end of sentence. Um, obviously that's not true everywhere. Um, but, and, and we were very relieved to find that, I have to admit. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that there are is there's a very serious problem with sexual harassment of graduate students by faculty. That's a whole other can of worms because our our focus was really undergraduates, not graduate students. Um, we don't have so much to say about that, but it's a very important topic. And I, I did just want to say one more thing about the sexual pleasure because yes, before before college, and also I think programs at elite institutions tend to just exacerbate disparities, right? So it's not just that it needs to happen earlier, but it needs to happen at institutions to which everyone has access, um, both for questions of equity and because um, as soon as young people start becoming sexually active, they also start becoming sexually assaulted or assaulting other people. Yeah, now, if I could just layer onto that for just one moment, you know, um, one of the reasons Jennifer and I advocate so strongly, there are many reasons why we advocate really strongly for comprehensive sexuality education, but you know the, the data in the United States indicate that people not at uh, uh, educational institutions or women not at, at in colleges and universities who are college and university age have higher rates of assault. The rates of assault are likely 20% higher 
among non-university women. And, um, you know, it, it shouldn't be so surprising to us that um, those women experience higher rates because they tend to be in more precarious positions. But if institutions like Columbia and Barnard focus just on solving their internal problems, they fundamentally fail in their social responsibility because in some ways they're building more inequity, as Jennifer just said, into the system. Like they're building greater levels of inequality. And so one of the things to ask, you know, in these sort of, I think there's sort of a critical discourse and political moment at Sciences Po and across a range of French institutions right now on this issue is to ask like, okay, it's important to tend to your own house and figure out what it is that the own internal policies would be. But it's similarly important to think about how it is that the knowledge, expertise, um, and understanding that an institution like Sciences Po, like a world leading institution develops, could be leveraged not just for Sciences Po, um, but to think about alleviating um, uh, these experiences in a much broader context. And, you know, I, I know I sound like a, you know, a, a broken record going over and over again the same thing, but it really is fundamentally about a commitment to equity and um, that, you know, women who go to universities and men who go to universities are more privileged than those who do not. And um, asking ourselves how we're going to commit to um, uh, conditions of equity more broadly conceived in our society and understand that as part of our sexual assault prevention strategies is essential. Okay, thank you so much. I think we will stop here because it's already um, 7 p.m. here. So again, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, uh, for and passage for organizing this and to those of you listening I hope that now you're motivated to read the book <laughs> so which is highly recommended um, and uh, yes we will stop here thank you very much thank you so much for having us and being in conversation thank, thank you, you. So and thank you for the very interesting questions <laughs> those of the audience bye